okay, I've got my mango cigar, and I'm ready for another chapter <laughs> of Spangler. Uh, we're chewing on the conception of time here. The destiny idea really is the idea of time, how temporality unfolds. And um, what he's going to do now is look at it from the point of view of physics, the physics version of time, in Einsteinian relativity, and so forth, and then he's going to look at the artistic conception of time uh, and compare and contrast the two. Uh, so he says, the way to the problem of time then begins in the primitive wistfulness and passes through its clearer issue, the destiny idea. We have now to try to outline briefly the content of that problem so far as it affects the subject of this book. The word time is a sort of charm to summon up that intensely personal something designated earlier as the proper uh, which, with an inner certainty, we oppose to the alien, uh, something that is born in upon each of us, amongst and within the crowding impressions of the sense life. The proper, destiny and time are interchangeable words. Proper means that which belongs to you. In German, it's eigen something. Uh, Heidegger has a word for it, too. Um, the problem of time, like that of destiny, has been completely misunderstood by all thinkers who have confined themselves to the systematic of the become. In Kant's celebrated theory, there is not, again and again, he's using Kant, Kant is almost like a, a pinata for him, he's constantly whipping Kant. In Kant's celebrated theory, there is not one word about its character of directedness. I want to try to bring out this hidden sense of humor in Spengler because Spengler did not have a sense of humor. I've never seen a single picture of him smiling. But there's funny shit in here if you know how to think about it. His, his constantly whipping of Kant is, I think, pretty comical. Not only so, but the omission has never even been noticed. But what is time as a length? Time without direction. Everything living, we can only repeat, has life, direction, impulse, will, a movement quality that is most intimately allied to yearning and has not the smallest element in common with the motion of the physicists. The living is indivisible and irreversible, once and uniquely occurring, and its course is entirely indeterminable by mechanics, for all such qualities belong to the essence of destiny and time, that which we actually feel at the sound of the word, which is clearer in music than in language and in poetry than in prose, has this organic essence, while space has none. And Kant and the rest, notwithstanding, it is impossible to bring time with space under one general critique. Space is a conception, but time is a word to indicate something inconceivable, a sound symbol. And to use it as a notion, scientifically, is utterly to misconceive its nature. Even the word direction, which unfortunately cannot be replaced by another, is liable to mislead owing to its visual content. The vector motion in physics is a case in point. For primitive man, the word time can have no meaning. He simply lives without any necessity of specifying an opposition to something else. He has time, but he knows nothing of it. All of us are conscious as being aware of space only and not of time. Space is, i.e. exists in and with our sense world, as a self-extension while we are living the ordinary life of dream, impulse, intuition, and conduct, and as space in the strict sense in the moments of strained attention. Time, on the contrary, is a discovery, which is only made by thinking. We create it <clears throat> as an idea or notion, and do not begin until much later to suspect that we ourselves are time, inasmuch as we live, and only the higher cultures whose world conceptions have reached the mechanical nature stage are capable of deriving from their consciousness of a well-ordered, measurable, and comprehensible spatial, the projected image of time, the phantom time which satisfies their need of comprehending, measuring, and causally ordering all. And this impulse, a sign of the sophistication of existence that makes its appearance quite early in every culture, fashions outside and beyond the real-life feeling that which is called time in all higher languages and has become for the town intellect a completely inorganic magnitude, as deceptive as it is current. But... If the characteristics, or rather the characteristic of extension, limit, and causality is really wizard's gear wherewith our proper soul attempts to conjure and bind alien powers 
Goethe speaks somewhere of the principle of reasonable order that we bear within ourselves and can impress as the real of our power upon everything that we touch. If all law is a fetter, which our world dread hurries to fix upon the in-crowding sensuous, a deep necessity of self-preservation, so also the invention of a time that is knowable and spatially representable within causality is a later act of this same self-preservation, an attempt to bind by the force of motion the tormenting inward riddle that is doubly tormenting to the intellect that has attained power only to find itself defied. Always a subtle hatred underlies the intellectual process by which anything is forced into the domain and form world of measure and law. The living is killed by being introduced into space, for space is dead and makes dead. With birth is given death, with the fulfillment, the end. Something dies within the woman when she conceives. Hence comes that eternal hatred of the sexes, child of world fear. The man destroys, in a very deep sense, when he begets, by bodily act in the sensuous world, by knowing in the intellectual. Even in Luther, the word know has the secondary genital sense. And with the knowledge of life, which remains alien to the lower animals, the knowledge of death has gained that power which dominates man's whole waking consciousness, by a picture of time, the actual is changed into the transitory. And this is interesting here because now he's incorporating sex into the picture uh, that I was talking about earlier, that the destiny idea involves sex and death. Uh, and we have both, and we experience both uh, as the two poles of being alive. And it is part of the destiny idea, the just living in the flow of life, having sex, begetting generations, the morphology of them growing old. Um, that's the stream, that's the flow of life that he's talking about. The intellect just gets in the way of all that. Um, it, it just gets in the way, and this is what he's talking about, where uh, intellectual men, hyper-intellectual men like Newton or Kant, become totally alienated from the world of actuality, and hence the world of sex and death. And their whole systems are very much designed as a defense against death, as a defense against sex as a defense against having to face that world of mortal confinement in a biological envelope. Um, the mere creation of the name time was an unparalleled deliverance. To name anything by a name is to win power over it. This is the essence of primitive man's art of magic. The evil powers are constrained by naming them, and the enemy is weakened or killed by coupling certain magic procedures with his name. He's right about this. The name... Uh, is everything. This is why uh, an Egyptian myth, which is still half magical consciousness structure, half mythical consciousness structure, names are so important uh, in Egypt, and most people had three or four different names. And there's a, there's a myth about I, uh, is it, yeah, Isis trying to get the sun god Ray's secret name out of him. And that can only happen because he gets stung by a scorpion, and she's got the antidote for it, but she'll only give it to him if Ray gives her his secret name. And he does, because he needs the antidote to the scorpion poison. So he gives it to Isis, and so she has power over Ray, the sun god, once she has his secret inmost name. And this is part of the magical consciousness structure. Names are very important. Even today, they're, they're, they're still important. And I remember Young pointing this out in a lot of his books, where he references and footnotes where he's talking about it's kind of it's not a coincidence that people's names suit them. He says uh, Freud's name is Freud, which means joy, which means the pleasure principle, basically orgasm, and his whole life was spent chasing the ple the pleasure principle. Sex here, sex there, everything means sex in your dreams. Sex this, sex that. Whereas Jung's name means youth, and his whole entire psychology is based on psychological transformations uh, that keep one ever young. Uh, so the two, they're appropriate. My last name, by the way, for, for, for the record, Ebert, uh, is German for boar. Uh, it, it traces back into German, uh, and it means boar. So at some point, I'm suspecting it must have been like a family crest, that someone had the boar on their family crest. Boars are pretty obnoxious. <laughs> they're, they're dangerous, and they're pretty obnoxious. You really have to tread carefully around the boar. Anyhow, I find that funny. So, um, And there is something of this primitive expression of world fear 
in the way in which all systematic philosophies use mere names as a last resort for getting rid of the incomprehensible, the almighty that is all too mighty for the intellect. We name something or other the absolute, and we feel ourselves at once its superior. Philosophy, the love of wisdom, is at the very bottom defense against the incomprehensible. What is named, comprehended, measured is ipso facto overpowered, made inert and taboo. Once more, knowledge is power. Herein lies one root of the difference between the idealist's and the realist's attitude towards the unapproachable. It is expressed by the two meanings of the German word uh, scheu, respect and abhorrence. And the footnote here from the translator says, the nearest English equivalent is perhaps the word fear. Fearful would correspond exactly but for the fact that in the second sense, the word is objective instead of subjective. The word shy itself bears the second meaning in such trivial words as gun shy, work shy, so forth. Um, okay, so the idealist contemplates. The realist would subject, mechanize, render innocuous. Plato and Goethe accept the secret in humility. Aristotle and Kant would open it up and destroy it. The most deeply significant example of this realism is in its treatment of the time problem, the dread mystery of time. Life itself must be spellbound and by the magic of comprehensibility, neutralized. All that has been said about time in scientific philosophy, psychology, and physics, the supposed answer to a question that had better never have been asked, namely, what is time, touches not at any point the secret itself, but only a spatially formed representative phantom. The livingness and directedness and faded course of real time is replaced by a figure which, be it never so intimately absorbed, is only a line, measurable, divisible, reversible, and not a portrait of that which is incapable of being portrayed by a time that can be mathematically expressed in such forms as, um, there's a little equation here, and then from which the assumption of a time of zero magnitude or of negative times is, to say the least, not excluded. Obviously, this is something quite outside the domain of life, destiny, and living historical time. It is a purely conceptual time system that is remote even from the sensuous life. One has only to substitute in any philosophical or physical treatise that one pleases this word destiny for the word time, and one will instantly see how understanding loses its way when language has emancipated it from sensation, and how impossible the group time and space is. What is not experienced and felt, what is merely group time and space is, what is, uh, I'm sorry, what is not experienced and felt, what is merely thought, necessarily takes a spatial form, and this explains why no systematic philosopher has been able to make anything out of the mystery-clouded, far-echoing sound symbols past and future. And Kant's utterances, <laughs> back to beating up Kant again. It's like every tenth line is like, uh, let, just let's beat up Kant. And it's funny because um, I'm on Spengler's side here. I'm, I'm one of these guys, I'm, I'm, I'm a world as history guy uh, with, with the feeling for how things become. I understand everything cr chronologically, whether it's uh, an artist's oeuvre uh, or what have you. I have to understand the sequence uh, chronologically in order to get any understanding of anything at all. So I live and think historically. Um, but on the other hand, uh, after Decline of the West, Kant's Critique of Pure Reason is my favorite work of philosophy. I think that thing is a masterpiece. I've read it three times, and I love it. Uh, it's so good. It's it, the, the architecture of it is so beautiful. It's like, as you're reading it, uh, it's like listening to a Haydn symphony or a Mozart symphony. It's, it's so classically pure and beautiful. Uh, it doesn't look like Spengler had that kind of appreciation for Kant. Uh, it's too bad. In Kant's utterances... Concerning time, they do not even occur, and in fact, one cannot see any relation which could connect them with what is said there. But only this spatial form enables time and space to be brought into functional interdependences, magnitudes of the same order, as four-dimensional vector analysis conspicuously shows. As early as 1813, Lagrange frankly described mechanics as a four-dimensional geometry, and even Newton's cautious conception of tempus absolutum civi duratio is not exempt from this intellectually uh, inevitable transformation of the living into mere extension. In the older philosophy, I found one and only one profound and reverent presentation of time. It is in Augustine. If no one questions me, I know. If I but explain to a questioner, I know not. 
When philosophers of the present day West hedge, as they all do, by saying that things are in time as in space and that outside them nothing is conceivable, they are merely putting another kind of space beside the ordinary one, just as one might, if one chose, call hope and electricity the two forces of the universe. It ought not surely to have escaped Kant <laughs> when he spoke of the two forms of perception that whereas it is easy enough to come to a scientific understanding about space, uh, though not to explain it uh, in the ordinary sense of the word, for that is beyond human powers, treatment of time on the same lines breaks down utterly. The reader of the Critique of Pure Reason and the Prolegomena will observe that Kant gives a well-considered proof for the connection of space and geometry, but carefully avoids doing the same for time and arithmetic. There he did not go beyond enunciation, and constant reassertion of analogy between the two conceptions lured him over a gap that would have been fatal to his system. Vis-a-vis -vis the where and the how, the when forms a world of its own, as distinct as is metaphysics from physics. Space, object, number, notion, causality are so intimately akin that it is impossible, as countless mistaken systems prove, to treat the one independently of the other. Mechanics is a copy of the logic of its day, and vice versa. The picture of thought as psychology builds it up and the picture of the space world as contemporary physics describes it, are reflections of one another. Conceptions and things, reasons and causes, conclusions and processes coincide so nicely, as received by the consciousness, that the abstract thinker himself has again and again succumbed to the temptation of setting forth the thought process graphically and schematically, witness Aristotle's and Kant's tabulated categories. Where there is no scheme, there is no philosophy, is the objection of principle, unacknowledged though it may be, that all professional philosophers have against the intuitives, to whom inwardly they feel themselves superior, just as like a Newton would look down on Goethe's science and regard it as that, uh, the science of a mere dilettante. Where's the mathematics? Um, that is why Kant crossly describes the Platonic style of thinking as the art of spending good words in Babel. And uh, it is Kant's Achilles heel as you read him, he doesn't understand art. He doesn't understand a fucking thing about art. Uh, you read through the critique of pure reason, the, the critique of practical reason, even the critique of judgment, which is supposed to be about art, uh, isn't about art. It's, it has nothing to do with it. Um, Kant knew nothing about art. And why even today, the lecture room philosopher has not a word to say about Goethe's philosophy. Every logical operation is capable of being drawn, every system a geometrical method of handling thoughts, and therefore time either finds no place in the system at all, or is made its victim. This is the refutation of that widely spread misunderstanding which connects time with arithmetic and space with geometry by superficial analogies, an error to which Kant ought never to have succumbed, though it is hardly surprising that Schopenhauer, with his incapacity for understanding mathematics, did so, because the living act of numbering is somehow or other related to time, number and time are constantly confused. But numbering is not number, any more than drawing is a drawing. Numbering and drawing are a becoming. Numbers and figures are things become. Kant and the rest have in mind now the living act, numbering, and now the result thereof, the relations of the finished figure. But the one belongs to the domain of life and time, the other to that of extension and causality. That, I calculate, the business of organic. What, I calculate, the business of inorganic, logic. Mathematics as a whole, in common language, arithmetic, and geometry, answers the how and the what, that is the problem of the natural order of things, in opposition to this problem stands that of the when of things, the specifically historical problem of destiny, future, and past. And all these things are comprised in the word chronology, which simple mankind understands fully and unequivocally. Between arithmetic and geometry there is no opposition, every kind of number as has been sufficiently shown in an earlier chapter, belongs entirely to the realm of the extended and the become, whether as a Euclidean magnitude or as an analytical function, and to which heading uh, should we have to assign the cyclometric functions, the binomial theorem, the Riemann surfaces, the theory of groups? Kant's scheme was refuted by Euler and D'Alembert before he even set it up, and only the unfamiliarity of his successors with the mathematics of their time what a contrast to Descartes, Pascal, and Leibniz, who evolved the mathematics of their time from the depths of their own philosophy. 
made it possible for mathematical notions of a relation between time and arithmetic to be passed on like an heirloom, almost uncriticized. It's interesting that the way that Spengler regards these earlier philosophers like Descartes, Pascal, and Leibniz because they came up with their own mathematical systems as real philosophers. In a way, even though he sides with the Gertan group, uh, the world as history, not with the world as, as nature, nonetheless, he is a bit of a snob in that he, he, he clearly does not regard a real philosopher as someone who can't do mathematics. If you can't do mathematics, you can't enter the form world of math. You are therefore not a real philosopher, is, is Spengler's assumption. Uh, he doesn't have any respect for Schopenhauer. Uh, Nietzsche, of course, he loves, but more as a literary figure. Um, and, of course, he loves Goethe as well. But, I mean, in a way, I, I, it's not entirely true, obviously, because Goethe is an exception. Goethe couldn't do math at all, and Spengler worships the guy. But um, he, he really does respect uh, philosophers who can come up with their own mathematical systems. But between becoming and any part whatsoever of mathematics, there is not the slightest contact. Newton, indeed, was profoundly convinced, and he was no mean philosopher, that in the principles of his calculus of fluxions, he had grasped the problem of becoming and therefore of time in a far subtler form, by the way, than Kant's. But even Newton's view could not be upheld, even though it may find advocates to this day, since Feierstrass proved that continuous functions exist, which either cannot be differentiated at all, or are all capable only of partial differentiation, this most deep-searching of all efforts to close with the time problem mathematically has been abandoned. Um, okay, there's, let's read this. There's one more section here now when he starts looking at it now from the point of view of the artists. Uh, sec subsection 3. Time is a counter-conception to space, arising out of space, just as the notion, as distinct from the fact of life, arises only in opposition to thought, and the notion, as distinct from the fact of birth and generation, only in opposition to death. This is implicit in the very essence of all awareness, just as any sense impression, impression is only remarked when it detaches itself from another, so any kind of understanding that is genuine critical activity is only made possible through the setting up of a new concept as antipole to one already present. So uh, every thought system, as far as he's concerned, is always based on a metaphysical bivalent opposition. Whether that opposition is evident to the thinker or not, it's always there and implicit in every metaphysical system. Or through the divorce, if we may call it so, of a pair of inwardly polar concepts, which as long as they are mere constituents, possess no actuality. It has long been presumed, and rightly beyond a doubt, that all root words, whether they express things or properties, have come into being by pairs. But even later, even today, the connotation that every new word receives is a reflection of some other. Uh, and so, guided by language, the understanding, incapable of fitting a sure inward subjective certainty of destiny into its form world, created time out of space as its opposite. But for this, we should possess neither the word nor its connotation, and so far is this process of word formation carried that the particular style of extension possessed by the classical world led to a specifically classical notion of time, differing from the time notions of India, China, and the West, exactly as classical space differs from the space of these cultures. For this reason, the notion of an art form, which again is a counter-concept, has only arisen when men became aware that their art creations had a connotation at all. That is, when the expression language of the art, along with its effects, had ceased to be something perfectly natural and taken for granted, as it still was in the time of the pyramid builders, and in that of the Mycenaean strongholds, and in that of the early Gothic cathedrals. Those are all morphologically homologous. Uh, men become suddenly aware of the existence of works, and then for the first time the understanding eye is able to distinguish a causal side and a destiny side in every living art. In every work that displays the whole man and the whole meaning of the existence, fear and longing lie close together, but they are and they remain different. To the fear, to the causal, belongs the whole taboo side of art. Its stock of motives, developed in strict schools and long craft training, carefully protected and piously transmitted, all of it that is comprehensible, learnable, numerical, all the logic of color, line, structure, order, which constitutes the mother tongue of every worthy artist and every great epoch. 
But the other side, opposed to the taboo, as the directed is to the extended, and as the development destiny within a form language to its syllogisms, comes out in genius, namely in that which is wholly personal to the individual artists. Their imaginative powers, creative passion, depth, and richness as against all mere mastery of form, and beyond even genius, in that superabundance of creativeness in the race which conditions the rise and fall of whole arts. This is the totem side, and owing to it, notwithstanding all the aesthetics of her pen, there is no timeless and solely true way of art, but only a history of art, marked like everything that lives with the sign of irreversibility. And this is why architecture of the grand style, which is the only one of the arts that handles the alien and fear instilling itself, the immediate extended, the stone, is naturally the early art in all cultures, and only step by step yields its primacy to the special arts of the city with their more mundane forms, the statue, the picture, the musical composition. Of all the great artists of the West, it was probably Michelangelo who suffered most acutely under the constant nightmare of world fear. And it was he who, alone among the Renaissance masters, never freed himself from the architectural. He even painted as though his surfaces were stone, become stiff, hateful. His work was a bitter wrestle with the powers of the cosmos which faced him and challenged him in the form of material. Whereas in the yearning Leonardo's color, we see, as it were, a glad materialization of the spiritual. But in every large architectural problem, an implacable causal logic, not to say mathematic, comes to expression. In the classical orders of columns, a Euclidean relation of beam and load. In the analytically disposed thrust system of Gothic vaulting, the dynamic relation of force and mass. Cottage building traditions, which are to be traced in the one and in the other, which are the necessary background, even of Egyptian architecture, which in fact develop in every early period and are regularly lost in every later, contain the whole sum of this logic of the extended. But the symbolism of direction and destiny is beyond all the technique of the great arts, and hardly approachable by way of aesthetics. It lies, to take some instances, in the contrast that is always felt, but never, either by Lessing or by Hebel, elucidated, between classical and Western tragedy, in the succession of scenes of old Egyptian relief, and generally in the serial arrangement of Egyptian statues, sphinxes, temple halls, in the choice as distinct from the treatment of materials, hardest diorite to affirm and softest wood to deny the future, in the occurrence and not in the grammar of the individual arts, e.g. the victory of arabesque over the early Christian picture, the retreat of oil painting before chamber music in the Baroque, in the utter diversity of intention in Egyptian, Chinese, and classical statuary. All these are matters of, are not matters of can, but of must. And therefore it is not mathematics and abstract thought, but the great arts, in their kinship with the contemporary religions, that give the key to the problem of time, a problem that can hardly be solved within the domain of history alone. This is a good stopping point, I think. Um, and it's worth underlining the fact that Spangler really has a feel for art and religion that Toynbee does not have. As you read Toynbee, and we will read Toynbee, um, the books are coming, and we'll read through those first three volumes to compare them with Spangler, but what you'll find is that Toynbee just does not have a feel for art. He, he does for religion, but not for art and literature and poetry and things like that, architecture. That's not Toynbee's uh, specialty, that's not his world. Even philosophy is not his world at all. He's strictly a historian and um, knows history better, I think, than Spangler does, in, in more detail, but doesn't know the history of the humanities as well as Spangler does. And for Spangler, the humanities are everything. Uh, the humanities, uh, religion, uh, architecture, painting, sculpture, these are the things that make a civilization what it is, as a civilization. Nothing else matters. Science is, like, is an afterthought, as far as he's concerned. Critical thinking, logic, that's all stuff added on much later. It has nothing to do with the indwelling essence of what a civilization is, which is formed by its arts of form. That's why they're called form, arts of form. Uh, and he sees men like Michelangelo and Leonardo, and he'll get more and more into them as we go along as you know the great men who have built our civilization, uh, not the Laplazes and the Lagranges and the Gosses and the Remons, they're great, but great in a different way that has nothing to do with building the interior architecture and the soul of a civilization, 
which expresses itself first in the springtime in its architectural forms. You get the Gothic cathedrals, homologous with the pyramids, homologous with the Mycenaean Tholoi, um, and so forth. Uh, at the beginning, as a form world that expresses an entire macrocosmos. Uh, and the next chapter is called Microcosmos, or is it macro, Macrocosmos? You don't get into that. Uh, how these architectural remains constitute a world picture in stone, and the whole world feeling of the culture at the beginning, in its dreamlike, visionary imagination, materializes itself almost magically in stone, and suddenly you've got a mosque, or it materializes itself and suddenly you've got uh, a, Doric, uh, a, a Doric temple uh, with, the, with the colonnade going around it, or it materializes itself out of the dream matter, and suddenly you've got a pyramid. And Spengler wants to convey this, that in this early springtime, these early architectural forms create uh, an entire world picture, and it's done in a dreamlike, unknowing, unthinking way. They just do it instinctively because they know they have to do it. These are the forms of our world. Um, intellect is not involved except as a problem-solving uh, aspect to make sure that you know the stones line up. You, you can trace the history of the pyramid. Uh, you can see them trying to figure it out. It, it, they had some failures that, that didn't work. Some the bent pyramid, for for example, that did, didn't work. <laughs> the red pyramid is the first true pyramid uh, prior to the Giza pyramids. Uh, they had a hard time fi figuring it out how to how to get it perfect. So the intellect is there, it's involved, but it's not involved in the world cosmic picture. The world as a cosmos, as a macrocosm. That's a religious idea, a vision held in the mind by the third eye, the pineal gland, let's say, if you want to materialize the third eye. And that vision has to be, uh, it, it finds itself, it incarnates itself in stone. And then that becomes the mother art for the rest of what follows. Uh, it makes possible a certain kind of statuary, a certain kind of painting, a certain kind of music. All of those art forms follow from the architecture, and they flow out of it. If you look at the history of the Gothic cathedral, for instance, and you see, if you look at Chartres, for instance, and you see all the saints in row upon row upon row, you see these guys, pretty soon they step forth. They get away from the cathedral, they step forth, and uh, they start sculpting individuals. Uh, individual saints, individual prophets in the round. And then pretty soon, you know, you wind down to Michelangelo, who decides, no, I'm not going to sculpt Christian figures. I'm going to go back and sculpt uh, Greek figures. Uh, and then so he works it out. And then he's working on a kind of painting. Meanwhile, oil painting uh, is coming off the walls where it first exists in these kinds of temples. Think of Giotto at the Arena Chapel, 1300. He's in there painting the history of the life of the Virgin. On the walls, this is fresco painting. It's still bound to the architecture, but pretty soon in the time of Leonardo, he paints the Last Supper, and it's doomed because it's a fresco, uh, but then he paints the Adoration of the Magi as an oil painting that you can hold on a canvas. Uh, and pretty soon, oil painting comes in, it detaches itself from the walls of the cathedral, and now we've got a new art form. Oil painting on a canvas, on an easel. We can paint this thing here and it's portable and take it anywhere we want. Then we get the rise and birth of oil painting from Titian to Rembrandt, uh, who are the great masters in there, Caravaggio, all these men in there who are masters of painting. So you see that all of this, all of these arts of form have come out of the architecture. The architecture is the mother, the nucleus of the culture from out of which all the other arts of form come. E even uh, music, even classical music comes out of Gregorian chant which is tied to singing in the cathedral, in the choirs of the cathedral. That just becomes uh, detached from the cathedral, and then over time uh, it becomes more and more ethereal, more and more materialized as it detaches itself from the liturgical world of the cathedral and rhythm and becomes its own unique thing. With Haydn and Mozart, you have a kind of secular music there, a kind of secular classical music it's no longer as it was in the days of Bach, tied completely to uh, the, the, the arts of form of, the, of architecture. That, those days are gone by the time you get down to uh, Mozart and Bach. Um, so this is Spengler's point. I'm elaborating it here, uh, but this is his point, that the arts of form figure out the destiny idea. Uh, they are manifestations of a culture's destiny idea, 
and that architecture is the mother of the arts and all the other arts flow forth from it in one way or another. But the architecture is a manifestation of what he calls world fear, um, which is tied in with this idea of the destiny idea, which is linked to our mortality. And the vision of human mortality uh, that we see that terrifies us and that we triumph over by creating these grand arts of form. Well, let's create a mosque. Uh, no, let's create a, a pyramid. Let's create a cathedral. And in doing so, we defeat death. We laugh at death. We mock death. Um, the world fear is triumphed over by creating uh, a world as destiny image in these grand arts of form.